Uh, thank you, and thanks to the National Health Council for, for inviting me uh, to speak today. Uh, so from the insurer's perspective, I think um, what we'd like to talk about now that we've got uh, legal certainty, which has been uh, you know, hanging over our heads for a couple of years, uh, is uh, going forward what we're going to do about affordability. Um, the promise of access is really hollow if nobody can afford uh, the access that's been, that's been granted or has been expanded. Um, so from a perspective of affordability, um, you know, at least the way I'm thinking about it is uh, what in the Affordable Care Act um, is, is, driving, uh, is driving lack of affordability and what uh, pre-existed the act or might be made a little worse by the act that we can, that we can address. So there's, there's a few things I'd like to touch on. Uh, first, there's a $70 billion premium tax. Um, so this is, uh, you know, going to get passed through. This is, um, you know, something that those who, uh, you know, get coverage or have coverage will wind up paying for one way or another, um, including those on public programs, including those uh, in, who have private coverage. Um, that's that's a big increase for, for folks to suck up. That's that's one. Uh, two essential health benefits. Um, the way that it's being discussed and implemented will require a buy-up in coverage um, uh, compared to what folks have now. So if you, um, you know, look at what the minimum actuarial value is for the different metal levels uh, and what's going to count as minimum essential coverage, uh, that's going to be a richer benefit package uh, than some folks have. Um, and so that's going to wind up affecting affordability as well. Not to say that those are not the right benefits, the right set of level uh, benefits at every, uh, at every uh, um, middle range, but to be aware uh, that richer benefit packages simply cost that pool of, of um, folks more money. Um, so there, and there's, there's potential ways to address that as well. Um, I think the biggest sleeper, ones that folks haven't really focused on that would be very useful to focus on, um, are the age rating bans. So January 1st, 2014, um, the age rating ban is going to go by law from uh, whatever it is in each individual state has, you know, 5 to 1, 7 to 1, to 3 to 1. That's a big change. Uh, and so for those who, uh, talking 150 health policy experts, uh, most of you I'm sure know what this is, but for those who haven't followed this closely, it's the differential between the least expensive and the, and the policy and, and what you can charge the charge as a premium for, for those who are uh, uh, most expensive. Uh, so if you compress from 7 to 1 to 3 to 1 overnight, um, the folks who uh, are paying relatively little, the relatively young and healthy, are going to get a very big premium increase. Um, that's going to be a shock. Uh, I think that needs to be addressed um, uh, to, to, encourage, to encourage access and affordability. Uh, and it leads to the last point. Um, we now know the personal coverage responsibility provision is legal, um, but uh, we know it's legal because it's not actually, uh, according to the court, a mandate. It's a choice. It's a choice to pay a penalty or, um, or get covered. If you choose to pay the penalty, it then turns into, um, is the penalty uh, likely to induce those who would otherwise not be covered to get covered? Um, the way the economics work out, the answer to a lot of that question for a lot of folks is no. Uh, and if you've got folks who are deciding not to get covered and you've got guaranteed issue, uh, you've got the same set of concerns over adverse selection that you did before the law uh, was, uh, was enacted and, and, and as we're existing now between 2014. I think that needs to be addressed um, if we're going to talk about affordability because the same um, you know, adverse selection death spiral uh, that could happen, you know, uh, with guaranteed issue. This is, uh, for those who are interested in this, um, we wrote a brief to the Supreme Court on separability explaining, that, explaining this, and part of our argument was cataloging what happened in the uh, seven states uh, that tried uh, market reforms without, uh, without getting everybody covered, without getting everybody in, and it was universally um, uh, a disaster, not workable, for different reasons in different states because there were different environments. But if you have a uh, guaranteed issue and you don't have a balanced risk pool, um, it, it selects down uh, and, and just gets more expensive for only those who are, uh, need the coverage, those who have a higher you know, incidence of, uh, of illness and burden are the ones who choose to get insured. Uh, and if you think about what insurance is, the average cost of care for that risk pool, risk pool simply gets more and more expensive and less and less affordable. Those who don't need the coverage as badly are willing to take the risk
risk of not getting ill that year, or choose not to get covered, uh, and, and it's, it's just it's a bad situation that spirals down. That's still a threat, and that needs to be addressed as well. So the Affordable Care Act has uh, several provisions I think that need to be uh, worked on, um, perhaps legislatively, some um, perhaps through uh, through regulation or, or, or other means uh, to address the question of affordability. Uh, so that's one. But putting that aside, um, Bob talked about this in unsustainable, and I'll use unsustainable, but there's a, been a rise in uh, medical costs um, that needs to be addressed as well. Um, this has uh, been going on for a long time, at least since the mid 90s. Um, pretty steadily, there's been a leveling lately related to um, you know, perhaps a lot of things, the economy and others. Um, but it really is a threat to long term um, fiscal stability of the public programs as well as private insurance. Um, I used to work in the antitrust division, so my you know, perspective in coming out this, uh, at least partially, is market power. Um, and you know, driving, um, you know, driving premiums, uh, you know, at least partially, is provider market power. Um, you know, year after year, you know, increase that can't be explained by anything else. If you look at Mark Copley's report as to what's driving premiums in, in eastern Massachusetts, uh, that's a nice synopsis of uh, what's going on in other parts of the country as well. Mark doesn't explain everything, but it explains, uh, I think, some areas, and it explains a lot. Uh, market power is going to need to be addressed. I think as far as the Affordable Care Act goes, where it's going to be uh, sort of uh, uh, most acute or most um, uh, most important to look at is in the ACO program. Uh, so the ACO program, I think for a lot of the uh, folks that you represent, um, you know, has a potential for a big upside in terms of care coordination, um, uh, benefits to patients. Um, you know, Bob mentioned, you know, medical homes. It's not the only way to go about this, um, but it is one way. Um, all that is really threatened, um, the benefits are threatened if the ACO program itself induces uh, horizontal and vertical coordination past where it needs to uh, to aggregate market power. Uh, so the program itself uh, is obviously public funds and those are set administratively, um, but the way that they've been set up, they've been encouraged uh, to uh, to be attractive to private um, to private insurers as well, and the issue of cost shifting, and the Bob mentioned, is a very very real one. So if you're able to show savings in the public programs and simply take um, you know take the market power that you've accumulated and raise prices on the private sector, you've really not done uh, what you promised to do in terms of in terms of cost savings and in terms of um, in terms of potential pay, uh, patient benefit. Um, so those are um, those are some of the things I think we'll need to be looking at going forward. Um, for those who are you know, particularly interested in the ACO program, I want to you know, emphasize um, this is not new. Uh, so there's a lot of this that's going on in the private sector. There's a lot of experimentation. Uh, two of my colleagues, Carmelo Bufino and Aparna Higgins, published an article in Health Affairs that um, catalogs uh, some of the experimentation around the country uh, that plans have been the plans have been put forward in terms of um, a wide range of care coordination, care coordination models, uh, ranging from uh, medical homes. There's actually one in our area. Uh, care Brewers Blue Cross started one uh, January 1st of last year. That's shown some initial success. Um, there's been some news reports. Uh, Edna and Brilliant in, um, in Western Virginia have uh, uh, paired up. Um, you know, the Kaiser model, the Isinger model uh, has been longstanding. Um, you know, these are all various ways to do care coordination. Um, and, and just a, a slight aside, uh, my hope for the ACO program is that it will you know, continue to permit uh, the kind of experimentation that I think you need to find out what actually works and not turn into a uh, one-size-fits-all model. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll stop. Uh,